So yeah, I'm uh, I'm Kevin Callum, and I'm known as the Happy Camper because I'm happy all the time out there. Okay, maybe not during the bug season, but most of the time I'm happy. So what uh, changed it all for me is uh, my dad brought me up uh, camping, fishing. We'd go to fishing lodges, and one day we're at the main lodge in Ogoma, and uh, we weren't catching any fish, so we used a Grumman canoe to go to the back lake. And I found that vessel to be amazing to get us into wilderness areas to get away. Portaging is a great thing at times. I hate it, but it gets you away from you know, the, the hustle and bustle of the big lakes and the boats. Nothing against motorboats, but the canoe was it for me. The neat thing about it, I went back there a number of years ago. I was 12 years old at the time, wrote my journal saying, you know, this is wilderness. I went back there when I was in my 40s and um, phoned my dad and said, you know, I'm, I'm in that spot. And he knew exactly where I was. I think the attraction of the canoe is that it's a simple lifestyle, simplicity. We actually are in a more and more in a very busy life, a very busy society, our work, um, we're working way too much. And to go in a canoe, it doesn't make any sense to like it, to be quite honest. You're, you're in a canoe and you're using your force to move. You're paddling all day. But I find it very meditative, like very relaxing to go in a canoe. And yeah, I like backpacking, I love kayaking, um, but the canoe does it to move for me. It, it's a very good time to think. And also, I think it's part of our culture. Not Canadian culture, right? Yeah, Canadians were all about canoeing. I, I, a lot of people don't know that, but we are all about canoeing. But around the world, we're all from wilderness, unless we're aliens put here. But basically, uh, we're all from wilderness. We're born from it. And the more connection we have to it and the more we travel through it, way, by canoe, for example, the more we reconnect with it. And I think we really need that. And I think that when people go canoeing, they get it. I think the canoe really is part of our culture because, um, you know, out west you go to the United States and it was the, the, the Wild West, uh, the 10 the gallon hat, the, the, the horse, that's how they traveled through areas. We travel by canoe. And, um, but I learned more about that when I was in Wales just a few months ago speaking. They really were jealous of me being from Canada. Um, they were in passion with the canoe. They loved the canoe, but they really had no canoe routes to go on. Maybe a night if they're lucky, but not a five day, not a 10 day, not a 20 day trip. And that's Canadian. Like the canoe is sure, certainly a part of our culture, but canoe tripping, I think, is more of our culture. It's the idea of going in wilderness for a long period of time and, and again, connecting to nature. And we really should know how lucky we are to have that in, in our country. Well, the benefits of canoeing keeps you healthy for sure, right? Keeps you connected to nature like we've talked about. But, um, but the benefits of canoeing itself too is that it, it brings you down, down, down to a simplistic lifestyle of, on a trip. You have all your belongings in your, your canoe. You go from A to B. And what's really important is I've written so many guidebooks about how to go from A to B, but the really important thing is what happens between A and B. That's what a canoe trip's all about. It doesn't matter where you go. My daughter doesn't have a clue where she is and she could care less where she goes as long as we go and as long as we have a good family trip together. And, um, I, you know, the neat thing is last year we're on this 12-day trip in Algonquin, and it was the very last day, and we're on this portage, and we meet these three guys, and it was those typical guys. They're dressed in full military outfit, but they're not military. The big white Tilly hat, nothing gets Tilly hats, but you know, you know what I'm talking about, and the big, huge knife, you know? And they're like, so how long have you been out for, little girl? And it's like, oh, this is going to be interesting, because she's dressed in her shorts and T-shirt, and, and uh, she goes, well, like, uh, how long have you been out? Oh, we've been out for three days surviving in the wilderness. You know, we're on a canoe trip. And she goes, oh, well, we've been out for 12 days. You've got to get out more. And that's what it's all about. I mean, that, that child was more comfortable out there than they were because they're trying to conquer over it. And she was actually being part of it. She was Canadian. So what's it really feel like starting a canoe trip, right? I mean, you, you're so pumped, you're so full of passion because it's been a long winter. You're like, oh, this is fantastic. I can't wait to go. And then the bugs come out. You're like, oh yeah, I forgot about the bugs. And, uh, and then you feel really you know, anxious because you're not used to being out there. And that's what happens. I mean, we, by day three, you actually sort of feel a little more comfortable, but that's usually when people go back. They always do a three day trip. In fact, actually the average canoe trip now is only like two nights and they're not connected. If you get to five days, you, you know, whatever sounds you heard in the first part 
are not a problem anymore because you need some sleep. So if you think a bear is going to kill you the first night, the fifth night, you could care less if the bear kills you. And then what happens on day 10, you don't think about the bear. You actually are connected out there. It's part of your lifestyle and it all becomes a very easy thing to do. And the hard part is to go back. You don't want to go back to real society. You don't want to go back to those anxious feelings going back to work. And I guess uh, to sum it all up is uh, I was giving a presentation one night and I was driving the highway to get there and there was a major accident. I went to minister first aid and the guy died and it wasn't good. And then I went to give my presentation and um, some woman during the presentation said, wasn't this wilderness travel in a canoe dangerous? No, not dangerous at all. Yeah, if I was going to convince someone to go on a canoe trip, there's the problem is that everybody, it doesn't matter who they are, are going to tell the misadventure stories to them. I mean, if you were out on a canoe trip and you saw a loon, it was a beautiful moment, and then a bear chased your buddy, like what story would you tell them when you got home? You would tell them about the bear story, right? But yeah, and, but our problem is we tell all these people that have never gone before those stories, and they look at us like, why would you do this? Uh, for a holiday, especially. And we tell those stories because we want that sense of adventure. And maybe our lives are boring at home, I don't know, but the idea of actually going on a trip, my wife, uh, we went on a trip on the Steel River and it was a really tough trip. And she said, that's the best trip of my life. I said, well, we almost died on that trip. She goes, yeah, but I never felt so alive in my life than on that trip. But the only way I found to convince those people that have never gone before to go is to drag them with you and then they'll get it. And then they'll actually turn out to, to be just like you and try to convince someone else. That's the only way, is to actually drag them by the ear and take them on a canoe trip. Bill Mason said that anybody that likes a portage is either a liar or crazy, and he's right. Um, nobody likes to portage. But what I get out of a portage is that if it's a really difficult one, like the Dixon Bonfield, five kilometers, or like the, the pig in Clarny that's straight up a hill, if you do it, you feel so good about yourself and then you get to the lake, and even if you meet someone, you probably won't because nobody in the right mind would want to do that portage, but if you do meet them, they're just like you. And I really find that the portage is the only thing left right now to keep wilderness wild. Because everybody goes, well, you know, um, we should just drive there, it'd be a lot easier. It's not wilderness if you drive there. And I was on the radio the other day and someone said, well, you know, why do you go, why would you do like 11 kilometers of portaging just to get to your brook trout lake? And I said, because it wouldn't be a brook trout lake if you drove there. They'd be stocked or they wouldn't be there. And if you don't get that, I, I don't want you on my lake, you know? So portaging really does keep it wild. And I hate it, you know, throughout the entire portage, but I love when I finish it. The classic one, my, I'm cursed for that. I'm, I'm the, my nickname in Peter was the wilderness pornographer. That's what I'm called. So people hate me. Um, because I have written guidebooks about the Quarth Islands. And the greatest one uh, story was I'm on this canoe trip in the Quarth Islands and I wrote a book about it and there's a young couple in front of us and they got my book and they were going the wrong way actually and I said, so I think the portage is to the right and they said, well, how would you know? I was like, oh yeah, okay. And so we went down the portage and then we get to the lake and there's some local guys with a cabin there and it was 9.30 in the morning they got a big bonfire going with a bunch of beers and they've driven their ATVs in and uh, I said hello to them, and they said hello back. But the young couple were behind us, and they, they said, Hey, how'd you get on our lake? And I was, oh, this is going to be interesting. And, oh, we got a guidebook by Kevin Cowan. He says to go here. And, well, this is our lake, and it's not. It's, it's a provincial park. They happen to have a camp on that lake. So I understand their, their frustration, because it's always been their spot, and now it's a, a very active park. But the classic one is, uh, is that they're like, Well, how, um, how'd you get on the lake? Well, the, we got Kevin Cowan's guidebook. Well, help us uh, burn it. We're having a book burning party. And that's why they had the bonfire going. They're burning all my books. I didn't know that. They're burning all my books in the fire and getting drunk on it. And, and, and I thought that was hilarious. Uh, and I probably made good money on that. The, the world is alone on that, that day. But the neat thing about it is um, that, you know, uh, being a wilderness pornographer, the idea of actually telling people your secret spot because you want to change things, you want to get them out there, and then you go there and it's full of people and then you have the garbage and everything else that sometimes happens. But it comes down to, if you talk to anybody that's done anything in protection of wilderness for years, like Sigurd Olson, Bill Mason, Eric Morris, all of them, they said 
Don't worry about all those things. You need to get the people out or you can kiss wilderness goodbye. You need to be the wilderness pornographer. And yeah, there's going to be a few people that will leave the garbage, but at least it's a park. And um, there's been times where I was in the north part of the Killarney Park and they're going to expand that park. And there was a guy that was very upset with me doing that and, and he confronted me. And I said, you're one individual, one person, and you're going to make sure that this isn't an area for people to canoe for the hundreds or thousands of people for years to come. I don't care about you. And that's really nasty to say, but I don't really care about you as an individual. You have a point. It, you personally love this place. It's self-interest, and so am I. But you know what? I, I think it's more important for us to be out here canoeing than it is for you to have your resort. Yeah, the canoe is very versatile. Uh, you think about it, uh, kayaking, um, a lot of people like. Sometimes I think that kayakers are canoeists that never got along with their canoe partner. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's true because you have to have good communication skills to be in a canoe with someone. A lot of people don't like paddling a canoe solo for some odd reason, so they go to the kayak. And I get it. I, I get that. It's, it makes sense. But the canoe is more versatile in one sense than the kayak. The kayak is made for its environment. Big lakes, big oceans. It makes sense to be in a kayak, not a canoe. But the canoe is made for the interior, for small creeks, small lakes, to get into an area and explore the rivers, um, all of Canada, for example. So it, it would make sense to use the canoe for those areas. If I lived on an ocean or I lived along Lake Superior, yeah, I would maybe want to kayak. Backpacking, it's for mountainous areas with little water. So the idea of where there's lots of water all connected, the canoe is perfect. And that's why it was invented and that's why we still use it today. Yeah, yeah, so a lot, a lot of people think that canoeing is difficult. And again, why a lot of people go to kayaking, and kayaking is not easy, but they think it's easier than the canoe. They think there's too much to, to learn. And we're in a society now where they want everything given quickly. I, I teach students a lot where they, with a canoe, all well, it takes too long to, to learn the skill. Well, that's why it's a great skill. It takes a while to learn it. But what I also find too is that um, you have to know how to portage, single portage. You have to know how to do the J stroke, the Canadian stroke, the, 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 the stern stroke, you know, all those strokes. And I think that's what we're missing now in society, that, you, that you, we, we take time to actually do that. Even building a canoe, for example, to build a canoe takes a lot of talent and versatility and, and people just want it. Well, can I just buy one? Uh, can't you just take me on a canoe trip? Um, I find you know, my whole life is uh, I've taught myself all those skills, how to get a fire going in the rain, how to uh, be happy out there, how to make good meals, how to portage and not feel the pain that much. How to, how to make sure that you uh, entice yourself to get across that portage. I see some young people that go out there and they want it instantaneously, but I also see a whole pile of others that get it. And I think canoeing will always last because there's that, that magic about it. Um, boy, I just went on a canoe trip last week with a bunch of students at risk, you know, and, and we had a couple of counselors that didn't want to be with them. They were afraid of them. I, I know these guys. They, 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 the one thing they want, why they wanted to go on a canoe trip is they didn't want to be at home. And being out in the wild, they're all happy. They're great out there. And we did a five-day trip, and they came back, and they were all just beaming. And I said, why are you beaming? Well, the one thing about wilderness tripping on a, in a canoe is that you are who you are. There's no facade. You have to be yourself. And they loved that because they spent most of their life faking their character to get rid of their issues, right? So yeah, I, I think the canoe is a really good symbol for that and a really good um, tool. Cool. Back in the 80s, I, I was taking students at risk back out there, but they were all, you know, a lot of trouble. They were all prostitutes, actually. Um, anyway, so we took them out for a one month canoe trip. But a number of years ago, I went to find them again, just to see what happened. And there were 17 of them, and I found 13 of them. And some of them were in jail, and some of them were, one was a principal of a high school in Toronto, one was an Air Force pilot. But I asked them all these questions, and the one question is, like, what did that trip do to you? And they all said, every single one said, it changed my life. I said, how, how would a canoe trip for a month change your life? And they said, because we weren't at home with those issues of society, we're actually our true selves in the wilderness, very, very simplistic lifestyle with all our belongings in the pack. We all got together. We had to get together uh, or get along together in the wilderness because that's how we, we got from A to B. 
And it did. It changed all their lives. And uh, even the ones that were in jail, I said, yeah, but it didn't change your life, obviously, because you're in jail. They go, oh, no, it would have been a lot worse. I would have killed myself or I would have OD'd whatever if I actually didn't have that canoe trip. A first-time paddler, go with a group that's been out before, uh, an outdoor club, canoe club, gain from their experience, uh, share their experience, share their gear, because <laughs> canoe tripping can be expensive, so don't buy stuff, go and borrow it from people, that, and they'll always let you borrow their canoe. I mean, if they're a really good canoeist, they'll, they'll let you borrow all their gear. And um, don't do a big, huge trip at first. Uh, go on a very easy trip and enjoy it, and the more you enjoy it, the more you go out. Then do the advanced skills after that. Probably don't do a river the very first trip. I've seen so many spouses oh, go, on, go on trips, and it's insane. Like, there's the dominant person in the back saying, you know, all you have to do is in the front is just power stroke. That's all you have to do, which is not true at all. And then what will happen is that that person in the front will just do the power stroke, and the person in the back will steer, and then they do a river. And it always will happen. They'll go down the river, they'll see the rock, and the person in the back will say, go left. And the person in the front will go, I don't know how to do that. I don't know how to do a draw, a cross draw. So the person in the back will try to compensate. The canoe will go sideways around the rock, right? And it's usually a married couple that get divorced. <laughs> and um, yeah, it's one of those things where if it's your first time on a canoe trip, don't do a river with your spouse. I would even say, actually, go on a canoe trip just before you get married to test the marriage out. I think that's a really good idea. Yeah, buying your first canoe. Um, I get that question a lot. What's the best canoe? And my first first canoe was uh, was out of the dump. I picked it out of the dump. It was a fiberglass. I had no money. I had a fiberglass canoe it had a Roadrunner sticker on it. I remember that? I don't know what brand it was. So three keel, I think. And I wrote two books with that with that canoe. And um, so the advice is, if you if you can't afford it, either borrow it or take it from the dump. But make sure you go out. I see so many people spending hours and weeks and everything else wondering what canoe to get well just get one and go you know um but also what what kind of canoe to get i would say lighter because i'm 50 you know kevlar but they're expensive uh but if you can afford a lighter canoe get it because they, they can be awkward spend a lot of money on your yoke uh probably not not even use the yoke the canoe comes with because usually it's a cheaper yoke um get a deep dish yoke made for you i'd spend the more money on that and I like a prospector model. Everybody kind of says, oh, here we go with the prospector idea. But if you think about it, the prospector design is not really perfect in anything, but it's good in everything. It, it's, it's a good load. You can carry a good load. It's stable, good initial stability, second stability. Uh, it goes relatively quickly on water. It's good in white water. But it's, and it's symmetrical, so you can actually go and sit in the front seat and pallet solo. So for the money, it's... If you're only going to have one canoe, it's not a bad canoe to have. Or you could have like 12 canoes in your backyard and figure out what you're doing that day. But yeah, the ultimate one is, uh, it's like anything. My, um, my wife and I, years ago, we got, we got robbed after a canoe trip and everything was taken. Except the canoe, actually. I guess they didn't like our canoe. But they ended up, uh, we were supposed to do a major trip in the far north a week afterwards. And I, I quit. I said, that's it. We're not going. We don't have the gear. And my wife said, but we have the gear that we used to use in the attic. And I said, oh, come on. It's like it's a canvas pack and rubber rain jacket. Like, forget that. We've gone past that. And she goes, well, we did fine before. So sure enough, she's right. <laughs> my wife is right. I've said that. Um, my wife uh, basically said, no, we're going to go. We used the old gear and our trip was fine. You know, and, and we learned from that. that it, it's the important thing is to go. Mm. Um. Okay, so planning a wilderness canoe trip, fantastic. I'm so glad you're going. You're going to love it. Some days you're not going to think that. You're going to question it. The storms are, are bad and the bear... No, no. I'll start that again. I don't want to get everybody right there. <laughs> yes, I know. Um, so you're going on a wilderness canoe trip, fantastic. Uh, you'll, you'll, you'll be so glad you went. And how to prepare for it? Well... You know, you know, if you've never been on a remote wilderness trip, maybe go with a group that has gone on before. And if so, make sure you know them. It's really important to go with people you like. Really important. If you go to, with, on a trip with people you don't like, like last year I went 
on a fishing trip in Algonquin with this one guy that hated fishing. He found it unethical. It's like, well, you know, that's fine you have that feelings, but we're on a fishing trip in Algonquin Park. So I should never have got him to go on the trip with this. Or a survival expert the year before where he ate mushrooms on the portage and started vomiting green. It's like, well, what? what were you doing that for? Um, and that's just a, not my style, right? So I shouldn't have gone with him. So you make sure you go with people that you can communicate well with, you get along with, and um, then look at where the route you're going in and say, okay, what if something happened? What can I do about that? So bring devices, technology. You, we can knock te technology, but I think if there's a piece of technology that could save your life, it's your duty to have it with you, actually, to be quite honest. You can bring a spot device or in reach, I think they're called. It's a device you push on a button. My, my mother is so embarrassing. My mother is always concerned about me doing my solo trips. And this thing helps me because I push a button and it sends her a message at home says Kevin Callan is fine and he's okay and it shows on Google map where I am and everything's fine. If I'm delayed I can push a button or if I'm in trouble 911 or another button for SOS and a helicopter comes. But the other thing too is on the other side of the coin don't push that button if you know you break a toenail. Like uh, deal with it. Uh, don't. What's happening now is people are pushing the buttons when nothing really happens and the government's getting very upset with that. Uh, last year someone pushed the button because they're their partner got sick. What was their dog that had diarrhea? I was like, come on. <laughs> it's like, um, and uh, th those are the issues we have to look at. I also, when I bring those devices, I have a satellite phone and a spot device. The satellite phone I have for emergencies, but I only tell one other person in my trip that I have it. All the other people don't know I have it because if they know I have a phone, they'll want to call home and that's a disconnection. As soon as they do that, the trip just goes downhill. As soon as they call home and talk to someone. And um, they don't need to, uh, unless they have to for an emergency. So um, what else would you do for Woodland's trip? Eat really well. Uh, don't eat mush. Don't eat crab dinner every day. Um, don't eat porridge every morning. That would be brutal. Uh, make really good, good meals. Dehydrate your meals on your own. I go to stores and look at those dehydrated packages, read the ingredients on the back, go to the bulk food store or, or go to the store myself and dehydrate my own meals for like two bucks instead of ten. And that will be a part of the trip too, is make your own meals. And um, for our also wilderness trips, um, make sure that every fourth or fifth day is a day off. So you have it that day to relax and do laundry and you know just chill out a bit and then continue on. And hmm, what else would you go on a wilderness trip? Just go. Uh, again, like after 10 days, you won't even know what day it is. I went on a 20 day trip last year and, I kept videotaping myself saying, on day, this day, this, I was wrong every day, what day it was. I didn't even know what day it was. And that was great. So the skills you would have to need for a wilderness trip is like paddling skills, really know how to paddle in the wind. Uh, I could tell you a whole bunch, like how to get a fire going, how to get a tarp going, tarp's really important. Uh, how, how to deal with uh, news and pairs, uh, not that that's a huge problem. How to deal with lightning strikes, crouching on a, on a tarp inside the tent, or on, a, on, a, on your thermorest inside the tent. But the biggest thing is my, gosh, my mother taught me this. Didn't be stupid. She's Scottish, eh? Didn't be stupid. And that's it. Just be logical about stuff, for heaven's sakes. You know, I could tell you everything. Make sure you wear your PFD. Make sure you don't run the rapids. and Just didn't be stupid. And think about it. Communicate with your people. Like I was on a trip in northern Quebec with a, a man and his son. And we're, there was a class 2 rapid before a waterfall. And he went to run the rapid. And I didn't. And he called me a sissy pants. So, oh, you sissy pants, Callan. You can run a class 2. I went, I know I can. We're in northern Quebec. If I don't, I go over the falls and I'm dead. And you have to deal with my body. And uh, he goes, well, I'm going to run it. And he did, but his son didn't. And I didn't. And I'm thinking, there goes the group dynamics. Big time. The son is like feeling inferior. We got an arrogant guy that, yes, he, he didn't die. And now we have a bad trip because, you know, he didn't listen to my mother. <laughs> um, so the coolest thing that's ever happened to me out there, boy, you know, I could tell you about a lynx going after my dog. I could tell you about a... A, a baby black bear going up a tree while I was urinating and the tree fell over and the, it, it was a nightmare. I could tell you stories of a monster pike inside the canoe flapping around. Um, I could tell you about uh, a girl's camp from, from uh, 
they were brutal, they were evil, uh, and um, yeah, I wouldn't even go into that. I, I could tell you endless stories of actually those, but my best trip is the next one I'm going on because it's all about going and planning the trip. Yes, I have great memories, great routes that I've gone on, but I can't wait to the next one. I think this whole video project or film project is amazing um, for many reasons. One is that you're doing it. <laughs> a lot of people are like, oh, I like to do this, I like to do this. Well, then do it, you know? It, it, I, I thinking back to all the books I've written, I got no help at all with those books um, because they didn't think I could do it. I just sat down and wrote it. I went on can went canoeing, quit my jobs, so I can canoe for a year and a half, you know? Um, so I think it's fantastic. I also think that you, this is a great project because you have a whole bunch of individual, passionate individual people. You have um, past students uh, in film. Uh, you have, like, basically, I'm guessing, I'm, I'm pretty sure that most of you guys are all volunteers, right? So, and that's what makes it happen because you just want it to happen. And we need a voice out there for the canoe to be the icon of Canada. And I got in trouble a number of years ago, but I'm still standing firm with this. I was on a BBC show uh, with Ray Mears, actually, and he asked me um, what I thought, the same sort of question. And I said, you know, we really messed up when we made the Canadian flag. It should not have the maple leaf on it. And the reason why is, I don't even know if it's a maple leaf or a Norway leaf, but it makes no sense to have the maple leaf. That really didn't make Canada, it didn't symbolize Canada. I love the Canadian flag. I am not knocking the flag whatsoever. I love it. But the idea is it should have had a canoe because that is what made Canada. And that is what makes Canada. And that's what we should be protecting. Canada is wilderness. When you go around the world, and like for, for me, the happy camper, I go to Wales, I go to Scotland, I go to South Korea, and I go to speak to those people. They're jealous again of me being in Canada because they believe to be us. They, they think every day we go paddling around the wilderness. And yet, do we? You know? I think we should be doing that. I think we should realize what we have in our own backyard and make sure that every single Canadian or every single person in this country or even more so, every person around the world should be in a, on a canoe trip because they'll feel the willingness, the, the connection to who, where they're from. They'll actually know themselves because you are who you are on a canoe trip and they'll be relaxed. I mean, look how hyper I am now. I am so hyper all the time. I, you ask all my canoe friends, am I like this on a canoe trip? No, I am so calm.